now we're, we're going to kind of close out the, a, the afternoon with a hackathon introduction talk to kind of talk about some of these problems and show uh, exactly what, what we have, have in store for you. So let me get this pulled up here. Okay, and so everyone can still see this. Uh, let me go to the beginning here. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this is the AI Free Assist Hackathon introduction. So, so a little bit of an overview for, for the purpose of the hackathon. Uh, the, goal, the goal of this is to allow participants in the summer school to practice their machine learning skills on Earth System Science challenge problems. Uh, we think that like the reason why we put a lot of effort into making this hackathon, not just have, ha have a series of, of talks, is that the best way to learn about machine learning is to actually do machine learning. And the best way to, to learn about on these particular problems is to actually like dig in on with the real world data and, and kind of work through all the all, all the challenges and decisions associated with them. We covered a lot of these decisions earlier today, but they're uh, the like the trade-offs of them really become apparent as you dig in further. Uh, we, we think this is useful not just for the Earth system science or uh, science experts, but also the AI experts because uh, can you close the door, Bob? Uh, our Earth system science practitioners get to utilize AI in a domain they're more familiar with, uh, but then the AI practitioners. Uh, so if you're coming watching this talk as an AI expert and, and just want to learn more about Earth system science, you you get to actually work with implementing your your favorite methods on, on these Earth system science problems and see where they work well and where they might fail. Uh, this map on the right here also kind of gives you an idea of just uh, where the people from the hackathon have registered. So we've got people. Uh, from all over the world, uh, five continents. Uh, so, so it's uh, I'm very impressed with the turnout, uh, and especially the people on that that, that are turning in, uh, tuning in from from Asia and are kind of flipping their schedules to to watch this and participate. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, the schedule for the hackathon is we have a called the shared work period from from two to six o'clock. So, so during this time, uh, we kind of asked all the participants in the hackathon to to try to be online together, so that you can, so that it's not just kind of working through the notebooks on your own, but but we want to encourage a kind of interactive participation, and we have a Slack channel set up for for the participants so that they can actually uh, talk with each other on their teams and with the other teams that are working on on problems together. Uh, we're going to have a we're all going to try to be available throughout the week on the Slack to during during the, especially during this time to answer questions that that everyone has and any problems that come up. Uh, but we'll really be focused on from the five to six o'clock range on having more open Q and A. So so if, like after you've gone through the stuff for the day, if there's any other like you found something interesting or something doesn't make sense, you want to learn more about it, then this is a good time to ask. Uh, around six o'clock, we ask every team to submit a note there. Uh, on Monday through Wednesday to submit their uh, team notebook. So, so each uh, team is, gr is groups of five people kind of randomly put together um, and kind of just to make sure you're all making progress and doing, and, and, and doing interesting stuff. Uh, we ask that you submit your, one, one of your team members submit a notebook onto a Google Drive at the, at the end of the day. Uh, then uh, on Thursday, like as you're working through the week, kind of keep track of so, some of the figures you're making and, uh, and other results you're getting with, as you're training different machine learning models. And then the idea is Thursday evening, we'll, we'll present a, you know, submit two Google slides for your, uh, that Karthik and I will, uh, and, and others will, will, will go over uh, Friday afternoon and kind of highlight the work the team, the different teams have done throughout the week. So we have, uh, so now we're going to talk about the different challenge problems. Uh, each challenge problem is kind of meant to 
to highlight some aspect of uh, Earth system science uh, and the kinds of issues you, you, you face with it. A lot of these have kind of a cloud focus, so so we're not the the problems aren't covering the entire Earth system uh, as much as we'd like to, but but we we did try to ha have a somewhat diverse set of different. Uh, kinds of problems that, that would allow you to, to try out kind of more image-based problems versus more time series based versus uh, uh, kind of, uh, so you get a kind of get a sense of the different methods and, and a lot of them you can apply many of the different approaches to them and, and see how they work. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the GOES machine learning challenge problem. Uh, this is focused on using GO16 or uh, data, which is a uh, GO16 is a weather satellite that orbits the Earth. It provides a hemispheric multispectral view of cloud patterns at high space and time resolution through its advanced baseline imager camera. And it, the satellite also has a geostationary lightning mapper instrument that records lightning flashes across the, its hemispheric view. So the, com the by combining these two the output from these two instruments, we can turn into a some, a, a, a pretty fun machine learning problem. Uh, in this case, we're trying to predict lightning uh, about an hour into the future. So we've we've gathered uh, and we care about lightning because it kills roughly 30 people each year in the U.S. and it has large economic impacts by disrupting outdoor work events and can spark fires and uh, cause lots of other problems. Uh, and so if we can predict lightning better in the short run, we can then, uh, uh, like maybe we can have more warning for like closing airports or amusement parks or any other outdoor event and help get people off golf courses uh, or out of pools. So, yeah, you, you, you can kind of go in that path. So lightning is uh, uh, important to understand how to predict better. Uh, for this, we, we're giving the participants the, uh, a selection of ABI and lightning count data that we've pre-extracted from, from the infrared channels of the, of, of the GOES satellite. Uh, we selected a 32 by 32 pixel image uh, across the domain um, with roughly every 20 minutes. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, time correlation reduced. Uh, and we, we pull data from March through October 2019 over, over the middle of the US. Uh, and we, we sampled both uh, patches where lightning occurred and where lightning didn't uh, with the idea that you train your model on both of those and then, then make predictions. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of what, what, what the imagery looks like. Uh, we have, these are e each, uh, there are 16 bands. Each band is the kind of reflected light from a, at a particular wavelength. And each wavelength kind of corresponds to different atmospheric phenomena. Uh, in these cases, we have, uh, like we're looking at the water vapor channels, which are called that because they, 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 they show up when, when there's high amount high concentrations of water vapor in the air. Uh, each of these uh, channels kind of lights up with water vapor at different levels. So you can use that to analyze uh, kind of where, how high in the atmosphere these different features are. Uh, yeah, some more information about the data. Uh, we also have some some example images. Uh, so they're, they're fairly like a, a kind of really zoomed in. It's hard to get out a lot of the details. Uh, but but the idea with this is that we want to feed these this data into a convolutional neural network or any other machine learning approach. So you could try feeding this into a random forest or or a linear regression or whatever your favorite model is and see how see how well that does and then compare it with uh, our kind of baseline approach, which we're using something called a residual network for that. And, and so, so we're going to yeah, combine all this together, uh, and then you can kind of take our base code that we've that we've implemented for this, and then extend it further and, and build your own machine learning approaches and, and do your own analysis of the data and see if you can uh, improve on what, what we've put out there. The second problem we have is is the from from a uh, instrument called the holodeck. Um, this, this is a uh, the in instrument is shown on the lower left corner here. Uh, let me. Sorry about this. this making sure there's nothing in the chat. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Right, so the the cloud particle. So we have the 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 whole deck is this this instrument here. It has a camera and a laser built into it, uh, and the idea is that the laser shines on the camera, and as the plane is flying through a cloud, the 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 light from the laser diffracts off of the cloud particles, uh, would be the ice crystals or water droplets, and then the the diffraction patterns are captured by the camera, and from that we can then invert it. Um, this holographic image uh, based off of like doing the inversion at, at different Z planes. And we can actually extract the, the exact structure of the of the ice crystal or the water, water droplet and its position in the frame and its size. Uh, so you get something that looks like this after from, from something that looks like this. And, we, and it's important for things like measuring droplet sizes, concentrations, and the relative positions of influence in their formation of drizzle and rain. Uh, we also care about ice crystal size, shape, and concentrations. Uh, and these are important because they control the radiative properties of things like cirrus clouds. And the radiative properties of cirrus clouds are really important for modulating things like the like climate change uh, and, and other uh, large atmospheric radiative balance effects. Uh, there's one of the biggest uncertainties in our climate models. So, the, so this instrument uh, put on our NCAR aircraft and we fly it through, through clouds all over the world and we can get a better sense of what, what the, the true, the observed values of these things are so that we can then make, uh, adjust our models accordingly. So the, the great thing about this instrument is that it's only one of the only instruments that can reliably measure mixed phase. So it can measure both ice and liquid droplet clouds. And simultaneously measure all the particles in the volume between the arms. So right here in a single picture and allows the retrieval of the 3D position of every cloud particle. So what's so what's the, uh, the, the, the trade-off with this? Uh, or how can we do this? First, uh, microscopic imaging using laser light source, the hologram is simply a 2D picture. Particles are intentionally unfocused. When we we do the refocusing with software, so we can uh, basically just do this iterative process and find the best 3D position of the particle. Uh, and and so with this example, we can show how we can refocus it and and focus in on certain particles while unfocusing on the other ones. Um, challenge though is that a single hologram may contain a thousand plus particles. Uh, traditional refocusing is performed a thousand times for each image while searching for the particles. And this is computationally expensive and labor intensive with up to 2 million core hours per project, the project being a field project. Uh, the processing is the primary bottleneck in improving the pro performance. So if we can speed up this processing step, we can, we can fly the instrument more often, look at more clouds and get through more data. And, and so it's basically, it opens up a lot of new science possibilities. So one approach to accelerating things is machine learning. Can, can is deep learning and machine learning up for this problem uh, that is currently done with more traditional signal processing techniques? Uh, to start with, we're not going to give you the thousand particle uh, images. We're going to start with some synthetic data using simplified holograms, uh, with circular droplets only. They're uh, originally in a CDF format for the cloud that we, we converted them to ZAR because it loads a lot faster. Uh, the training data consists of synthetic grayscale hologram images, and then we get the X, Y, Z, and D position for each particle, as well as a reference variable to link particles to holograms. So you can match, we have both single particle and multi-particle images. And, and so here's an example of the data. We end up having to reduce the volume of the training data down to 15,000 because it, like, it's, a lot, it's a lot of data. We're, like for training, we're giving you a 400 by 600 image, and that and that's even a reduced from the actual uh, hol uh, holodeck data, which is which is a, a multi megapixel picture. Uh, so here's an example of the three particle data. So so one particle is pretty straightforward because you just have one kind of set of concentric circles. But with the three particles, you have all these interference patterns that intersect with each other. That make that makes it a little bit harder to to tease out exactly where the particles are. And so we're we're working we're going to we've provided a data set and notebook for you to, to work on this and try to predict the either the exact positions of the particles. Uh, we also have a variation of it that that uh, where you're just predicting kind of the a combination of Z and the mass. So so 
uh, it's a challenging problem. We haven't come up with the full solution yet uh, on how to solve this. So, so we'd be interested to see what, what people can come up with. Uh, for the Gecko A machine learning challenge problem, uh, this is an atmospheric chemistry problem. Um, so, so in this case, natural and anthropogenic sources emit a large number of volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. Uh, so, so we have our trees and power plants and burning of trees. Uh, these volatile organic compounds uh, undergo complicated chemical reactions and physical processes in the atmosphere, forming organic aerosols. Uh, there's about 100 emitted gases, but their photochemical oxidation in the atmosphere leads to hundreds of thousands of volatile products that can then condense to form these organic aerosols in particular. Uh, aerosols have, organic aerosols have a significant direct and indirect radiation effect. They affect human air quality and human health. And to evaluate the broad impacts of, of these on air quality, we need to understand the sources and fates of these compounds. So currently, we the, the, the way this is done, uh, I shouldn't, shouldn't say we because I'm not an atmospheric chemist, uh, the, or atmospheric chemistry collaborators on this project, uh, they, they perform laboratory experiments, uh, conduct field campaigns, uh, and then they also run air quality and chemistry climate forecasts and with numerical models uh, that, that kind of use a much more simplified uh, chemistry model equation. But the, the true chemistry is extremely complicated. So the left figure is a cool visual illustration of the Leeds master chemical mechanism, a near explicit gas phase chemical mechanism with 16,000 chemical reactions. Uh, although it's complicated, the MCM is constructed based on a quite simple framework. Yeah, most air quality models and chemistry climate models cannot even afford to run this uh, MCM. It's, and no, it's not impossible. It's just so expensive that mostly it's not practical and meaningful at all. And so what can we do when we have something that's really expensive uh, and we want to scale it up? Well, we can try doing, potentially doing machine learning. And our candidate model is not MCM, but uh, Gecko A, or the generator of explicit chemistry and kinetics of organics in the atmosphere. So we tell Gecko A how the atoms, bonds, and functional groups and molecule radicals behave. So Gecko A will predict which, what reactions it may undergo. Gecko A generated chemical mechanisms that are extremely large and complicated. For instance, this alpha pinene is a common compound emitted from trees. Its oxidation mechanism involves over 400,000 compounds and over 2 million chemical reactions. Uh, and the, the found that Gecko A reveals unique information that no, no other mechanisms can offer. Uh, however, we can't run Gecko A in a three-dimensional atmospheric model. So how, how are we going to get around this bottleneck? Uh, so, so here's some more kind of descriptions of, of how all the particles. So we have the we take our precursor particle directly from 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 our whatever the source is. Uh, it combines with all these other products, uh, and then we group all the values based off of their volatility. So, so it's just a measure of how we're binning the data. Uh, and then the, the products will partition between the gas phase and particle phase. So, so the, uh, we care about how many particles end up in the particle phase versus the gas phase because that, uh, the partitioning is determined by the property of the particle, like the volatility and the environmental conditions. And the organic aerosols are very different in properties and environmental impacts. So our, our, our challenge here, getting through all the background is that we, we've run Gecko A a bunch of times for alpha pinene across and, and other chemicals. I think for, for, for this, we're using dodecane for the, for the machine learning challenge. And we sampled a bunch of different atmospheric conditions and we've uh, run Gecko A in all these conditions. And then we've taken the output from Gecko A and we're gonna feed it into a neural network uh, emulator that will then try to approximate what Gecko A would do under all these situations and then be able to interpolate in this high dimensional space between everything. And the idea with this is that we could then put the emulator into a 3D model and let it interact with the real atmosphere and, and see what happens. But first we gotta make sure the machine learning model runs well with just getting Gecko A right. So that's your challenge here. And this is kind of what, what, data, what the data will look like as you, as you run through, through it in the, in the problem. Uh, we have 2,000 Gecko A simulations uh, for each chemical. We run Gecko A under certain conditions for five days. Uh, we have 2,000 input files that were originally CSV format, and we converted to Parquet for the, for the hackathon. 
Uh, each file contains a mass of precursors, a mass of products of the gas phase, a mass of products in the particle phase, and all these as a function of time. So this is a long time series type problem. Uh, our next problem is the machine learning in the warm rain process. So this is our microphysics challenge. Uh, the warm rain process is critical for weather and climate prediction, uh, simply parameterized in large scale models of bulk microphysics. Um, so, so basically we try to represent the, the entire distribution of, of water drops and ice crystals as a, like a, a gamma distribution essentially. Uh, we can use more complicated distributions to represent them, but they're much more computationally expensive because you have to store that much, that many more variables and model all their interactions. Um, so we wanted to see if we could use machine learning to emulate the these more complicated mic microphysics schemes uh, and, uh, and run closer to the speed of the original bulk approximation. Uh, and how and we want to also see how does this affect cloud feedbacks, kind of like with the holodeck. The holodeck is interested in observing these cloud feedbacks. Now we want to improve our modeling of them. So we kind of, these things sort of tied together. And we're really interested in, in neural network emulators for, for seeing what happens and then speeding up the model so we can again run, run this more complicated scheme in a climate model. Uh, so in this particular case, we're going to replace the existing CAM6 MG2 bulk microphysics warm rain formation process. So we're not replacing the entire microphysics, we're just replacing one subroutine, one part of it, uh, with an explicit bin model from uh, from the Tel Aviv University or Tau bin model. And here, here's an example of bulk on the left versus bin on the right. Uh, the the current scheme uses uh, from Kural Nov and Kogan 2000. These are these are uh, it's actually an emulator itself uh, emulation of uh, it's a regression emulation of large eddy simulations with an explicit bin model. Um, in particular, we care about modeling auto conversion, which is uh, inverse function of drop number um, and and accretion. So auto conversion is where you're going from cloud droplets to raindrops, and accretion is where you have a rain droplet that a raindrop that's uh, colliding with cloud droplets and growing bigger in the process. And so here's kind of a description of, of the of the approach. Uh, we, we basically, we kind of, to, to build the data, so we end up doing kind of a hybrid, we, we take a bulk size distribution, break it up into bins, run the bin version of the distribution through our bin scheme, and then convert it back into a bulk scheme again, and then and keep going forward. Uh, and we can basically make sure this is all physically consistent and work well. Uh, so we've run CAM6 uh, for two years with this approach, and we built a neural network emulator as a baseline. Uh, uh, this consists of, uh, I think, seven neural networks that, that are a part of the system. Um, and we have to do some transformations and normalizations to get get all this to work. Uh, if you look at the data, it's extremely exponentially distributed and has a lot of zeros. So we kind of split it up into a two-step problem uh, for that reason. Uh, so so part of the challenge with this is can we improve on this uh, with uh, on this approach with, with the approach you come up with, or do you, you just try different approaches and see like how much do they do worse? Do they do about the same? What's kind of the space of possibilities here? Uh, and for the next one, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ankur, who's going to talk about uh, his, his contribution to uh, his challenge problem. Yeah, thanks. Excited to work on forecasting El Nino with uh, a subset of the hackathon participants. So, uh, whoops, brought, yeah. Uh, El Nino is a cycle of warm and cold temperatures in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. That's the dominant pattern that influences seasonal temperature. Uh, it's particularly important for climate sensitive sectors such as energy and agriculture uh, because it has ties to the monsoon in India, to the North Atlantic hurricane basin, to North American temperature and precipitation. So one important value out of machine learning is to forecast El Nino. Uh, the way that El Nino is measured is through the Nino 3.4 index, that's one of multiple ways to measure it, which is a rolling three month average of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. Uh, on the diagram on the right, you can see that the anomalously warm temperatures mean that means that the climate is in the El Nino phase. And if it were cold, it would mean that the climate's in the La Nina phase. 
Next slide. So currently the way that El Nino is forecast uh, is through weather centers such as GFDL um, or the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts or the UK Met Office. And they run physics-based, very computationally expensive models that are dynamical. So they model the Earth's physics directly. Uh, and in the hackathon, we're going to explore using neural networks to potentially create even more accurate forecasts. But one additional benefit is that neural networks have a lighter computational cost during inference. This means that it'd be easier to train an ensemble of neural networks to get a better estimate of uncertainty. The challenge with using neural networks is that there are limited historical observations, only about 40 years of reliable historical observations to use as training data. So we'll explore training on simulated data from general circulation models. Next slide. So to give you a sense of the types of questions that we'll be exploring, um, uh, you know, on, on the right, you can see that the predictors uh, are surface temperature. So that's the input to the machine learning model. And the target is the aforementioned index that uh, measures the state of El Nino. So we'll be exploring various questions that come across during the scientific method of, of forecasting El Nino, such as how much data matters, how can we trust the results of the neural network, how can we combine neural networks with other forecasting techniques to get the best forecast, and how far can we push neural networks. So can we push them to make skillful predictions two months ahead, three, four, five, six months? And then can we push them to go beyond El Nino and to start forecast land, to start forecasting land itself? We've selected three locations on Earth, um, specifically Lima, Peru, Akron, Ohio, and Mexico City, Mexico. But given the really diverse audience that's participating in the hackathon, it'd be great to see if you all can train neural networks to forecast land temperatures at your location, uh, just so that we can see how the skill varies from location to location. Uh, next slide. So here's what some of the forecasts that you might generate through the course of the hackathon will look like. The dark red line is observations, and then the other colors represent other types of models that are used for this task. Um, and so you can see that so far at four months lead times, the forecasts match the observations pretty closely. But there is still a little bit of room for improvement. For example, in 2011, uh, one of the machine learning models, as well as the European Center's model, predicted something that was too low. Um, and likewise, in 2016, their predictions weren't uh, extreme enough. They were um, you know, also predicting something that was too low, but uh, not at the highest positive value of the Nino 3.4 index. So on the next slide, you'll see you know, the ultimate goal of why this hackathon is on ENSO forecasting, because there's still work to do. Um, for extreme values of the Nino 3.4 index, Machine learning doesn't perform well as the dynamical models from the state of the art, so there's still work to do. Well, I fixed my muting. Uh, now I kind of go over some logistics for the for the hackathon itself. Uh, the, for the broader audience who are still watching, the Hackathon notebooks are on GitHub at, uh, at this web address, github.com slash ncar slash AI for ESS Hackathon 2020. Uh, there you can down, we have instructions for how you can set up the, the, the notebooks locally on your, on your computer. Uh, you can, there's also links to Google Colab uh, sessions that, that basically just will spin up from, from, GitHub, from GitHub for the notebooks. Uh, so these are kind of the freely available options uh, that, that, that we that, that we wanted to provide. Uh, since there was a lot of interest, and not everyone was able to to kind of work during this time period, but still wants to play with the data. The data is all hosted on AWS uh, under NCAR's uh, uh, AWS uh, bucket. Uh, so so the so the the notebooks I'll pull from there. Uh, keep that in mind if you're on a relatively questionable interconnection, or or if you're running on like the, some of these data sets are quite large so please be careful about um uh like downloading everything because it's they're all multi-gigabyte data sets so so uh, if you have some kind of uh cap on data cap or whatever then 
I recommend running using Colab or some other approach where you can run in the cloud or run remotely uh, if, if possible. Uh, for, for those who are hackathon participants, uh, we, we set up a Jupyter Hub in, on AWS courtesy of uh, AWS uh, grant uh, to uh, a very generous uh, grant of cloud credits to, to, to set this up and run it. Uh, we have, uh, so we, we set up there, we send a link to you, it's emailed to you and it's also in the Slack for the hackathon. Uh, to get into it, you'll log in with your, the Gmail slash G Suite account you provided at registration. Uh, so if you figure out the, the web address and try to log in, uh, we, won't, we have limited the, 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 the login ability to those who, who, who are registered for it. So. Uh, it'll, it'll, you'll get a 403 forbidden error otherwise. Um, uh, if you did sign up and are getting that, we will, uh, I will uh, get back to you and, and address those issues after the, the hackathon. We, we can still et edit some of the, the list. Um, you should see a loading screen with a progress bar will appear and then it'll take you to a Jupyter Lab session. Um, and then the notebooks directory, you can open the challenge notebook assigned to your team. You get 60 or so gigabytes of RAM, uh, GPU, uh, and I think four processor, four CPUs to, 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 to use on there. So, so hopefully you'll get, uh, uh, be, be able to compute through all, all the data and, and build some new machine learning models and test them out over the course of the week. Uh, also, uh, we set we set up the teams to encourage you to get to know each other on the teams. They're they're, they're essentially randomly selected, so you, you you are probably working with people from all over the world, uh, likely people you haven't met before. Uh, so so encourage you to get to know them over the course of the week. Also, please treat each other really nicely uh, and respectfully, uh, and uh, professionally. Everyone agreed to a code of conduct as part of this, so please follow that. And we are monitoring all the chats. Uh, and everything to make sure that uh, everyone is behaving respectfully. Um, and, and if there's any bad behavior, please contact myself or Tasia, uh, and we will uh, uh, get to, if someone is be behaving unprofessionally, we, we will kick them out of the hackathon and uh, uh, do whatever else we need to do, depending on, on, on the problem. So uh, with that, we, we hope, Exciting week for everyone is able to contribute. Uh, we're also looking forward to see, so on the logistics of this, we, as I mentioned earlier, we'll submit presentations throughout the week uh, or submit notebooks throughout the week. And on Thursday, submit kind of your team, submit your, what you found. Uh, this is kind of, it's not, this is not a strictly a contest. So we, we're kind of interested in sort of the knowledge discovery aspect of it. So you, so even if you didn't get the, most performant machine learning model in the world. We still want to hear about what challenges you experienced, what you learned from this, uh, any cool visualizations you made al along the way. We want you to share that in a couple of slides uh, and we'll combine those all for each challenge problem and present them on Friday uh, for, for everyone to see. So it's also, I hope you stick around and keep plucking through the problems. And if there's other issues, please contact us in the Slack and the email. So with that, uh, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, uh, a, a good Monday. Uh, uh, I think it went really well so far. I'm really impressed with all the attendance and questions people asking. Uh, please stick around in, in the hackathon for those who are, who are participating. Uh, and you can also, if you find issues and you're doing it uh, outside the hackathon, please post an issue on the GitHub page and we'll, we'll try to address those as well. And the recording will be available later this afternoon, uh, according to Paul. So I uh, also you know, thank Paul Martinez and Brett Batterman and our uh, Mary and Tasia and, and everyone uh, working the, the, the slide up behind the scenes. They had a lot of questions to handle. So thank you very much. And we'll see you all again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, so uh, and we'll, we'll have deep learning day tomorrow. So thank you very much. And goodbye.